Welcome, everyone. We're so glad you've joined us today. Today we are with Jennifer Bennett from Volunteer Match, and she is going to help us present information to you about engaging volunteers in new ways. The um, <clears throat> Arizona State Library is excited to share this information with you. And um, at the end, we'll give you a little bit more information about other resources that might be of service to you. So Jennifer Bennett, welcome and take it away. Jennifer, I don't think you have audio going right now. Are you able to uh, call in? Okay, she's going to try dialing back in. While she's doing that, I'm just going to bump ahead to the very end and tell you about our uh, resources while she's getting all called in. So the Get Involved Powered by Your Library was um, an initiative started in California, and it was focused on engaging highly skilled volunteers. Libraries have long had wonderful volunteers that have done all sorts of things for us, from shelving books to cutting out story time um, supplies to providing uh, help with our book sales and our friends group. But this initiative really focused on engaging those uh, retirees that had wonderful skills that still wanted to put them to good use. So we started looking at ways that volunteers could impact our community in different ways, whether it be a graphic designer or a marketing expert or someone who knows a lot about databases or even those who are great at tutoring. Um, so w the California State Library began working with a grant and then we've expanded that since then to include four states California, Arizona, Idaho, and Texas. And through this work, we've accumulated many different supplies and, um, and resources. So we've added them to the Get Involved Clearinghouse. And there are lots of great resources there that you can use. And also we have a Get Involved group uh, on Facebook, which helps share ideas, ask questions, and so if you would like to do that, you just need to log on to Facebook and search Get Involved Powered by Your Library, and you could request to be added. It is a closed group, so it's great. All of our comments are shared just with the group, and it's a really safe place to ask questions and explore ideas and new issues. All right, Jennifer, let me unmute you. How's that? Are you back on? I'm back. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes, we can. Yay. Great. Oh, my goodness. I'm so sorry. Yes. I had, I don't know what happened. I tried to dial in, and then it didn't uh, like that. Right. So, so um, I, I gave you the presenter ball, but I should have changed back to slide one first. So if you okay. want to just skip all the way back to the beginning of the sh slideshow, you can begin your presentation. Yeah, and actually, I'm actually at the airport, so I'm on my phone, and I'm not able to see the screen. I'm not sure how okay. to make that work on this. Sorry about that. So well, I that's might actually... all right. What I'm going to do is stay presenter then, and you just tell oh, me yeah. when, when you need me to advance your slides. That would be perfect. Thank you so all right. much. All right. Okay, so we are at the go... title page. Yep, you're good perfect. to go. Perfect. I can see your screen. So let's go ahead and oh, jump forward to the agenda. 
Um, all right, so I apologize, you guys, for the technical difficulties. Um, we are going to go ahead and talk today about sort of what it feels like to be a volunteer in your organization and really what we know about what volunteers want. Today's volunteers want to be lifelong learners. They want to accomplish something important with their time. So we're going to talk about how we can make sure that our volunteer engagement strategies or our volunteer engagement programs are attractive to them. So we're going to talk about evolving our programs from maybe what they've been um, to, to something that uh, not only meets the needs of your library, but is really attractive um, and, and, and interesting to volunteers. And we're going to talk about the importance of creating involvement, flexibility, and creating a connection with your volunteers. We're also today going to talk a little bit about some steps that you can take to start thinking a little bit differently, to start to evolve either what you're offering uh, volunteers to do as work, the way that you're engaging volunteers, or the types of volunteers that you're engaging. I'm going to leave you guys with some things to think about, and then hopefully we should have time for questions at the end. Since we're getting a late start, you can always contact me directly if you have a question come up. Okay, Donna, next slide, please. All right, as I was thinking about designing this webinar, I was really thinking about a good analogy, and what I came up with was the idea of streets. Right? So if you are, um, you know, in your car and you're trying to get somewhere and if you're on a cul-de-sac, um, you're not going very far, right? There's only one way in. There's not really much you can do when you get there. Uh, I didn't want to say a dead end, but it is a dead end. And sometimes our volunteer engagement programs feel like that to a volunteer if there's just one or two opportunities, if there's not a lot of room for growth or developing new skills or taking on more responsibilities. A volunteer volunteer may leave. Sometimes we feel like our volunteers have an expiration date. They stay with us for a couple of months and then they, they move on. That could be because your, your program or your volunteer opportunities feel like a dead end. Some of you may be familiar with something that feels like a country road. My background, um, starting with grassroots organizations, this was definitely one of the, the models that I was familiar with. Um, if you hang in there, eventually you might get some responsibility, you might be able to do something cool, but there's nothing written down, there's no clear pathways. Sometimes you're kind of waiting for someone else to retire to be able to move into a slot. We don't want our volunteers to feel like that either. What we really want to think about is how can we make our volunteer engagement program a highway? Uh, if you think about the highway, it's easy to get on, it's easy to get off. Um, here in California, we have big electronic signs that tell you how long it takes you to get to places like the airport or the bridge. Um, we, can, we can really manage some of those expectations for our volunteers. Uh, if you do, if you need to take a break, if you need to get off and get a snack or fill up your car, you can do that and you can get back on really easily. So we really want to think about how we can create that direct route, the most direct route to impact and engagement for our volunteers. So as we go through today, think a little bit about what uh, that might feel like or what that might look like to your volunteers. I was doing this in person um, a while back and one of the attendees said that he thought his volunteer program might actually just be a parking lot. So sometimes that's what it feels like too, just a place where we put our volunteers to keep them out of the way. So think about how your uh, opportunities, your organizations, your library's culture might be setting your volunteers up either to succeed by creating that highway or where you might be actually sort of hemming them in or, or, or putting them in a cul-de-sac. Next slide, please. So what are some of those things that we can think about? And I know this is my fourth webinar with you guys, so some of this is probably going to sound pretty familiar. It's really important that we design work that's meaningful to our volunteers and important to our libraries. So where is that balance? We don't want our volunteers to just be doing busy work. We want them to know why their work matters and how they're making a difference. Um, but we also need to make sure that we're giving that work to the right volunteer, that the volunteer understands what it, why it's important, that the volunteer either has the proper training or characteristics to be good at that role. We want to set everybody up for success, especially when we can um, really start to create that connection between the volunteers, your patrons, your library, the community, making sure that our volunteers know why this work matters. Uh, we all know that time is our most valuable resource in today's world, so we want to make sure that not only are we giving our volunteers work that's meaningful to them, but we're helping them understand why it's important important to our libraries. 
with that said, we need to make sure that we're building all of this flexibility, which we'll talk about in just a minute, on top of a strong foundation. So that means making sure that we have things like position descriptions, making sure that we have things like training um, or reporting structures in place so that we don't leave our volunteers sort of on their own to try to figure out how to make it work. Um, and then the last piece, which we've talked a little bit about today, is making sure that not only do we know the impact of the volunteers um, on our library, the, the work and support that they provide to our patrons or to our community, but that we're sharing it with them and with others in our library. So we talk about that a lot um, in the webinar series we've done together, is making sure that we're telling that story of volunteer impact. We're really talking about building a relationship here and making sure that our volunteers understand Understand the role they play in the library and how important that role is to the success of the library and the success of the library's work in the community. All right, next slide, please. So how do we do this? The first piece we want to think about is involvement. And there's a couple of ways that we can invite volunteers to come into our organization more. Um, one of the things that we want to make sure that we have in place are what I would call training or experience pathways. What do you need to know or do or be to be the right volunteer for this role? And as we think about strengthening or, or building a longer term relationship with volunteers, we want to give volunteers something to work towards. You may know a volunteer that shows up on week one is going to need a lot more training, a lot more support than the volunteer that comes in after six months or even longer. And we want to make sure that volunteers are, have a place to go, have a, a, a goal to work towards, more responsibility to take on, um, and that they have something to do uh, to work towards, something to do when they get there, right? That's our problem with the cul-de-sac is that there's nowhere to go. So if I want to go on that highway to become uh, um, a, you know, a, a computer lab tutor, how do I get to be that person? If I want to maybe take on more responsibility or, or have more um, authority within the library with the work that I'm doing, how do I get there? So we want to make sure that it's clear how that happens. I mentioned in that country road model, uh, especially in grassroots organizations, sometimes things really develop organically and we don't really know how somebody gets to do something. You may find that some of that happens in your library. You might have one or two volunteers who have really carved out their own niche, but that's not something that um, we can replicate if only one person, if only one volunteer knows what they're doing and knows how they do it. So we want to make sure that we're getting some of those foundation pieces in place so that we can invite others to participate. We don't want it to feel like um, roles or responsibilities or information only belong to certain people in our organization. That's one of those things, again, that can keep volunteers from staying with us. And that's oftentimes that country road model, right? You have to wait until somebody sort of um, decides that you're worthy to learn something or participate in something. We don't want it to feel like that for our volunteers either. When we have those training and experience pathways, what are we doing to help our volunteers get those skills? It's one thing to say you need to have this much experience or this much time in the library or take this class or, or work on a project, but um, unless we help them get there, again, we might have volunteers that are leaving our organization, um, trying to find an organization or an opportunity that gives them more of what they're looking for. The other thing we can do here is think about where we can start to elevate volunteers into leadership roles, um, not just sort of uh, across the board um, and not based on longevity, but really thinking about ways that volunteers can help you better do the work of leading, managing, and engaging volunteers so it doesn't just fall on you. Sometimes we might have team leaders or shift leaders. That would be a good example of a leadership position. Um, the other thing we might I think about here is creating some tiered opportunities. So as I mentioned, that volunteer's experience level on week one is going to be really different than after they've been with us for a while. Um, having that entry level volunteer position and then a medium or an intermediate uh, set of responsibilities and then that senior or experienced position might be a good way to, again, give volunteers an opportunity to build skills with you, to work towards something to create that stronger relationship. So think about where you might be able to invite volunteers into leadership roles in your volunteer engagement program, within the library, um, and uh, in general, um, not just within the work that you're doing, but where you might be able to give volunteers an opportunity to step up. 
we've talked about some of these shift leaders or team leaders. Um, great. We'll just move forward. I know we're running short on time. The next thing that we want to think about is flexibility. And I know oftentimes flexibility can be one of those sort of dirty words, right? It sounds scary. It would be great if everybody just came and did exactly what we told them to do, exactly when we told them to do it, and nobody ever had a scheduling conflict or something else that they wanted to do. But unfortunately, that's not really how life works. Um, our volunteers are humans, and humans have lives, so we need to make try to find a way to accommodate that. Um, so we want to think about where we can incorporate different types or different levels of responsibilities. I've mentioned that we want to think about where we can give our volunteers leadership opportunities, but if we think about that highway, right, um, if I need to take a break, if I need to take a nap or get a snack or fill my car up, I can do that. I can step away for a little bit and then I can get back on. We want to think about how we can apply that to volunteer engagement. If you just have one opportunity or just a few opportunities, or if your schedule is very fixed, that's more of that cul-de-sac model, I'm going to have to leave. If I, can't, if I can't do the opportunity that's available, it doesn't work with my schedule, with childcare or work, I don't have an opportunity to volunteer with your library. So how do we think about this um, without sort of letting everything just be willy-nilly? We still want people to be responsible and accountable. And we can do that by designing good positions. So um, we know one size volunteering doesn't fit all. We want to think about how we can start to incorporate things like project-based opportunities, remote or virtual volunteering opportunities, so that volunteers can take their opportunities with them. If you have a volunteer who's been with you who is now going to start spend, be spending, um, you know, well, you guys are in Arizona, so they might be go back home during the summer to where it's colder um, during the winter, you might have snowbirds. You don't want your snowbirds to leave you. You want them to come back and uh, you know, this time of year, October, November, when they're leaving the snow and coming to you, when they go home back to the north, what can they do to take with them? Is there something that they can continue to do remotely so that you don't have to start that relationship all over again? Again, we have an opportunity to let volunteers help us. Again, we want to make sure that volunteers are part of the process. So let volunteers help you. They know what they do better than maybe even you. Um, they know the work. Help invite them to participate in designing those position descriptions, creating those foundation components or training pathways. Um, when we invite volunteers to participate, not only are we building that stronger relationship, we're also giving them that opportunity to step into more of a, a leadership role or create more of a, of a relationship with us. All right, next slide, please. Understanding is one of those things that we hopefully can think about um, doing in a more strategic way. Sometimes we do this in an ad hoc manner. We might incorporate some of this information in our orientations, um, but we really want to make sure that we're thinking about how we share information with our volunteers. Unfortunately, sometimes in our cultures, we have this idea that we can build a silo or maybe put a fence around that cul-de-sac and our volunteers won't get out and information won't get in and they'll just do what they're told and they won't ask questions. Um, if you've ever heard, well, why do volunteers need to know that? Uh, that might be a challenge within your library. So we really want to think about how we can create um, those those communication channels or that communication strategy to make sure that information is getting to your volunteers. What's happening? Are there new things that you're thinking about um, within your library about how you deliver services? Are you seeing changes in your uh, patron demographic or your community demographics? What are you responding to? Are there things that you're thinking about implementing, new programs, new policies, um, best practices? We want to make sure that all of this information is getting to your volunteers volunteers, even if you sort of think they might not need it. This is, again, where we invite volunteers into our organization and sort of manage those expectations rather than trying to keep them at arm's length or trying to filter what information gets to them because we think they don't need it or that we think it doesn't matter to them. Um, we want to make sure that we're sharing those milestones, too. What have you accomplished? What are you working on? And when we think about this, we want to make sure that we incorporate this into recognition as well. Um, again, this is a shift, and I know that it's one of the easier things to do for recognition is to count up hours and to maybe put together those milestones. But I would guess very few of your volunteers are in it just for the hours, right? They want to see the, the 
clients experience change. They want to help someone find a job. They want to help a kid find a book that they're going to love. Um, we want to make sure that we're putting that impact into our thank yous. So not just thank you for spending the, this many hours with us, but because you were here, um, we were able to accomplish this. Or because you did this, we were able to uh, give these services to these clients, or our clients were able to do X, Y, and Z. Uh, and this is really where we can start to incorporate maybe some of the beneficiaries of that direct service or the work that the library is doing. Um, you know, having that um, story time draw those pictures or write those thank you notes, um, those job seekers really share some feedback about what it meant to have someone help them negotiate that process. That's where we start to get to the really good stuff. Again, building that relationship. And as important as it is for us to say thank you at the end of the shift or at the end of the project or when milestones are reached and as great as it is to celebrate it with other volunteers, this thank you becomes really powerful when we spread it to our whole community. And this is where social media can be really, really useful. Um, getting that word out there, talking about what volunteers are doing, appreciating the work that they're doing. Um, it makes our volunteers proud to be able to share that or show that. And it's also some passive recruitment um, when we see, when others see what volunteers are capable of doing, how they're involved in your library, they may want to be involved as well. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so what do we do? How do we start to think about this? How do we start to really um, make that shift? So the first thing we want to do is think about how we can turn our volunteers into advocates. And sometimes I know the word advocate can conjure up, you know, writing letters to your congressman. That's not necessarily what I mean here, although you may find that you want to encourage your, your volunteers to, um, you know, educate others about things that are happening in your community. But really what we want our volunteers to do is to be informed and excited about the work that they're doing with our library and for them to go out into the community and tell that story to their friends, to their coworkers, uh, to their family, to whomever. Um, we want, when they run into a, a, someone they haven't seen in a while in the grocery store, we want them to say, oh my gosh, I've been doing this great volunteering with the library, let me tell you about it. That's what we want when we mean we've turned our volunteers into advocates. Maybe we're encouraging them to uh, inspire inspire others to act, but maybe they're just getting that sense of satisfaction um, and that they understand the impact and the role that they're playing. I think it's important for our volunteers to understand why we do what we do. I don't expect my volunteers to be able to recite the mission of volunteer match, uh, you know, on command, but I also want to make sure that the first time and the only time I talk about the mission isn't at orientation, that we talk about the mission and how that relates to work and how that relates to the impact that we're making in the community. So make sure you're sharing that. Make sure you're sharing those accomplishments that are happening, especially as it meets your mission or as it helps you serve the community. Where do you have those community connections? Are you partnering with other organizations? Are you launching new programming or new support services? Uh, make sure that, vol that volunteers know about that, even if it's not in their area, even if these are behind the scenes volunteers and you're doing more community outreach or these are community outreach volunteers and you're doing some um, designing more opportunities behind the scenes because you never know who uh, they might know who might be a good fit and it helps our volunteers put their work into context. Sometimes when our volunteers are very segregated or separated into programmatic work, they may not know what's going on on the other side of the library or what's happening out in the community. We want to make sure that that information gets shared uh, and that those um, volunteers are sort of um, cross-informed, if you will, that they have all of that information going both ways. We also want to tell them that they can and should spread the word. And this is, again, where um, social media can be really powerful. Um, you know, putting together things like short video clips or infographics that we share with our volunteers and encourage them to share with their friends and family and their networks can be a great way, again, for our volunteers to sort of take pride in what they're doing. They want to inspire others or they want to tell that story, especially as we're going into the holidays. We know people are going to be getting together. Make sure you're arming them with their impact and those great stories that they can take with them. 
and that call to action about how they might be able to involve their friends. Uh, again, we don't want to think about, well, volunteers don't need to know that, or, um, you know, what if the volunteers don't want to do that? That's okay. We don't have to force people to be advocates for the work that we do. But when we arm them, you might find that uh, this sort of happens naturally. We see this sometimes happen to um, us in our organizations with leadership. If you arm, you know, your library director with great stories of the work that volunteers are doing, I bet those start to slip into her conversations with other community-based organizations or with funders or with decision makers in your library. Um, this it might be a little bit, uh, depending upon what your library structure is, whether you work with friends of, your, of the library in your community or how uh, additional people, people can additionally support your library financially. Um, but I, guess, I would guess that there's probably some overlap between the people who volunteer and the people who donate to support or, um, you know, uh, come out and, and buy books at your, your book sale or donate through friends of the library in your community if you're set up that way. Make sure you're considering a targeted approach here. Um, we don't want those buckets to feel really separate. And if you do have a friends group, um, it, it may require a little bit more coordination, but we want to make sure that those volunteers are getting a different type of recognition than just your regular donors. Um, we want to make sure that everything feels integrated and cohesive. We want our volunteers who also donate to get a combined thank you, not a thank you for volunteering and a thank you for donating that feels like we don't know that they're doing both, but that really combined sort of support message that comes together. All right, um, next slide, please. So we are going to switch gears a little bit for the second half, and I know I raced through that to make sure that we sort of stayed on track. Um, so if you have questions, feel free to type those in and um, on the first half, and we'll jump into the second half. So what should we do to think about this? Some of you may have some ideas that are starting to float up already. Um, really, we want to think here about making sure that we have a strategic plan. Um, some of you may have a strategic plan for your library. Some of you may have a strategic plan for volunteer engagement. Some of you might have both. It's really hard to figure out what to do if you don't know where you're going. So we want to make sure that we're thinking three years or five years out, especially if we're seeing shifts in demographics of either our volunteers or of the patrons or clients that we're serving. So for those of you who have volunteers who are aging with you, um, if you look forward five years, what's the average age of your volunteer going to be? Is that something that might need to prompt you to respond to uh, current challenges to your recruitment and your retention strategies. If you are starting to see new populations come into your neighborhood, maybe we need to think about recruiting different types of volunteers or volunteers with different types of language skills um, so that we are better able to serve the needs of our clients and our patrons. I know many of us who work with volunteers have multiple hats that we wear and that oftentimes it feels like um, every day is a fire drill. I also know sometimes it feels like you're just on that hamster wheel. You're running as fast as you can just to stay in the same place, not to fall behind. What we need to do as leaders of volunteer engagement is to get off that hamster wheel. How many hours a week do you need to be able to think strategically about volunteer engagement for your library? If you are the only one recruiting volunteers and screening volunteers and training volunteers and recognizing volunteers and managing volunteers, you're never going to be able to get that step back to think strategically. And actually, I have to say, I know Carl is on the call today. Um, when we started this work originally with the libraries, there are really good examples of libraries out there tapping into volunteer time and talent to help them do some of the management piece of volunteer engagement. Um, placement counselors, talent scouts, whatever you call them and whatever discrete tasks you decide to delegate to either recruitment or screening or training or support and recognition. Um, get. Get that step back. Give yourself the hours you need to think about how you can be that leader so that you can respond um, strategically rather than be a, someone who's reacting to something that sort of shows up out of the blue. Um, it's really important that we think about that um, because that's really our role. So we may also be doers of volunteer engagement, but we can't just be doers of volunteer engagement. We also need to be leaders of volunteer engagement. 
think about what kind of a volunteer engagement strategy or what kind of a volunteer engagement program you have now and what you want it to look like. Again, this is where we might need some time in our schedule, a few hours a week, to be able to block off to think strategically and do it, block it off, because if you just leave it open, it will get filled up with other things. Um, block off that time to think about the challenges, to run assessments, to pull together focus groups of your volunteers. What do you want a volunteer to be able to experience when they come into your library? What kinds of pathways do you want to create for them? We know not everyone is going to want to shelve books and not everyone is going to want to read to kids. So where are those other pathways for people in your library so that they can get involved? Remember that highway, how long is it going to take to get there? Um, if I need to take, get, get off and take a break, if I um, have to deal with an aging parent, if I have to deal with a work conflict, if I want to travel myself, how do I get back on? Um, so really thinking about what that that program or what that experience feels like to a volunteer in your organization. If you are struggling with retention, if you have those volunteers with expiration dates, we really want to think about not just where volunteers drop out, but why. So sometimes we can see that, right? Just the nature of volunteer recruitment and engagement is that we start with a big funnel and we work our way down. Um, so not everyone who comes in at the top of the funnel is going to be the right person to do the work in our libraries. But sometimes we can see there's a hole in our funnel or there's an offshoot of our funnel and we can see where people start to drop out. If you're not sure, this is a great conversation to have both with volunteers who left your organization and with volunteers who are with your organization. Um, what do they like about the work? Um, where do they feel restricted or challenged? Um, and where are there things that you can respond to? I know sometimes it can be hard to ask some of those volunteer satisfaction questions. Nobody wants to hear that they're not doing a perfect job, um, but if we don't ask some of these questions, if we don't understand maybe where the work that we're doing is either preventing volunteers or excluding volunteers from participating, we're not going to be able to fix that. Um, this is one of those things, uh, when I came to Volunteer Match, and I've been here for a while now, but when I came to Volunteer Match, I had already had almost a decade of work in the space recruiting volunteers, but primarily recruiting volunteers for direct service. I had worked in the wildlife rehabilitation and conservation field, so, you know, hands-on animal care or going to classrooms with owls and, and all kinds of really great one-to-one -one connections with clients, whether those were human clients or animal clients. And after that, I went to work um, with the Justice and Diversity Center at the Bar Association of San Francisco. Um, it, connecting lawyers with clients who wouldn't necessarily be served by the legal community. Again, direct connection one-on-one, -on -one, and in some cases, hundreds of volunteer, hundreds of clients for one volunteer at like a legal clinic. When I came to Volunteer Match, I was recruiting a lot of volunteers. I was getting a lot of people in the door. And I started to notice that uh, after a couple of weeks or maybe a month, that volunteer would send me an email or call me up or say to me at the end of the shift, you know what, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. You know, I don't think this is a good fit for me. And I thought, gosh, oh no, Volunteer Match has hired me to be an expert. Maybe I don't exactly know all the things. Um, so I took a step back and I reached out to some of those volunteers and I Ask us a couple of simple questions, including what did you know, uh, you know, on the, the day that you decided it wasn't a good fit that you wish you had known on the first day. And what I realized was that I was so used to a direct service, I was using a lot of language and talking about a lot of impact that you could get from interacting with clients. But at Volunteer Match, our volunteers work behind the scenes. Um, they're working uh, in the office, they're working remotely, they're working on the website. So I needed to change how I was talking about the work. I needed to talk about who I was recruiting. I was recruiting all of these great volunteers who were totally suited for direct service, but I didn't have any direct service to give them. So we really want to think about where we might have an opportunity to do something a little bit better, what we can learn from our volunteers, uh, attack those challenges, don't ignore them. And unless we ask those questions, unless we try to find solutions, we're not going to be able to solve them. If we just ignore them and hope they go away, I guarantee that they won't. Um, the other thing here, and we've talked about this a bunch today, is making sure that this is not only on your desk. 
first of all, we want to be a leader of volunteer engagement. And by being a leader, that means that we involve others. Um, we delegate, um, we inspire, we encourage others to participate. Um, but also, when we start to rethink how volunteers work in our libraries, when we start to envision different types of roles um, or different types of responsibilities, we need to make sure that we're building buy-in, not just from other paid staff, but from volunteers as well. Uh, for example, if one of those things that you need to do is to make sure your foundation components are all in line so that you can start to build some flexibility on top of that, I might start looking at my position descriptions. If I go to my volunteers and say, hey, I wrote a position description for you, uh, I'm not, you know, just do it, that's not a great sort of sense of um, collaboration. We want to invite volunteers who know their work into that process, invite volunteers to be part of writing those position descriptions, developing those training programs. Again, we can't do all of this ourselves. If we're the only person, we're stuck on that hamster wheel, we're going to be the doer of all the volunteer engagement, but we can't be the leader of volunteer engagement. So make sure that you don't just go into your office and close your door and come out with a strategic plan and position descriptions or whatever that might be, we want to invite other stakeholders, both volunteer stakeholders as well as paid staff stakeholders. All right, next slide, please. Perfect, thank you. So what do we do here? Um, how do we start to think about this? There may be something that feels a little bit easier. There might be a first step. Sometimes it's creating some documentation um, around the structure that exists now. So if you are a little bit of that country road model, um, if things are a little bit loosey-goosey in your organization, we want to make sure that we are putting those pieces in place. Um, we want to let volunteers know what they can do with your, our libraries or what they can do with our organizations and how they can get there. Um, Again, thinking about not just what the work is, but who that right person is. What does the volunteer need to know or do or be to be the right person for this role? And if they do need training, if they need to learn things on the job, are we providing that for them? Are we helping them get there? Again, I know flexibility can sometimes feel like a dirty word, um, but just because someone needs flexibility to be able to volunteer with your library doesn't mean that they're not reliable, dependable, or accountable. And we talk about that when we talk about those position descriptions, right? Those responsibilities, who are they accountable to? Um, where do they have decision-making authority? And where do they need to check in with a supervisor so that we are making sure that the decision-making authority is sort of in line with the experience that that volunteer has. And you may have some volunteers in your organization who have a lot of decision-making authority and may be accountable for really important components within your library. That's what we want to think about. How do we get there and, and how do we empower other volunteers in a way that doesn't open our library up to risk but still allows them to have some flexibility? Um, that idea that a volunteer is going to come at Wednesday at 1 p.m. from now until the end of time, that's, that's a unicorn in today's society. Society. We might get a few of those, but they're going to be few and far between. We need to think about how we can empower volunteers to come into our libraries and work um, to help us meet our mission, help us serve the community in a way that still allows them to have a life in today's society. So if you are seeing some of those expiration dates, volunteers who can sort of make that work for a short period of time, but then when it starts to sort of bump into the rest of life, they need to leave, that's that cul-de-sac, right? How do we create more of that highway so that they can take a break if they need to or have those other types of opportunities that are more portable that they can take with them? The other thing we need to think about when we think about flexibility um, is where this rigidity comes from. Sometimes in our organization, it comes from our culture. Sometimes it comes from leadership. Sometimes we have had bad experiences with volunteers who run with more authority than they should have had or have made bad decisions. Sometimes it comes from us. Hey, you know what? If everybody just does what I tell them to do and shows up when I tell them to do it, it does make my life easier. But that's not really realistic. That means that I have a really sort of a leaky bucket of volunteers because I've set 
expectations that are too rigid or responsibilities that are not flexible enough and the only recourse that volunteers have is to leave. Or if we're in that country road model, I've asked them to jump through so many hoops or I've asked them to wait so long that they're gonna go somewhere else where they know they can make an impact or they can have the kind of responsibility that they're looking for. So we need to figure out where that comes from within our organization. And if it does come from us, what can we do to make sure that we are empowering volunteers without opening our organizations up to risk or without making our job exceptionally harder? So so it does, right, make it easier if everyone just shows up when you tell them to show up, but that's not necessarily a, excuse me, a sustainable solution for volunteer engagement. The other thing we want to think about here is, again, that communication plan. So I talked a little bit about that. How are we communicating to volunteers? What are we prioritizing in those communication channels? And this is always, I think, a kind of an opportunity for leaders of volunteer engagement. Um, we may have volunteers that run the gamut from teens up through volunteers who are you know, in their 80s or even in their 90s. And the way that they prefer to have communication um, sent to them or the the communication channels that they're using may be really different, right? Our older volunteers may not be responding to emails, but I'm pretty sure, at least in my experience with my high school volunteers, they're not responding to emails either. But the way my volunteers who are older want to be communicated with is going to be different than how my volunteers who are younger are going to want to be communicated with. So we need to think about what works for them. Again, where can we build some flexibility into our systems without overwhelming ourselves? Um, and how can we invite volunteers to help us? If we still have volunteers who need to have phone calls, can we create a team of volunteers to call them up and let them know what's going on. Um, and if we have volunteers who will only respond to texts or direct messages, um, we need to make sure that we have a solution or system in place for that as well. Again, we want to communicate to our volunteers so that they are excited about the work that they're doing, that they are inspired by the work that they're doing, and that they understand the work that they're doing well enough to go out there and tell everyone else how awesome it is to volunteer with your library. All right, next slide, please. So the good news is, is that you, you really don't need to change everything all at once. And in fact, that's why we talk about making sure that we have that strategic plan in place first. We need to know where we're going. Um, and until we know where we're going, we don't know what to do. So making sure that you're thinking about that. Um, and again, this can be part of a strategic plan that's larger for your entire library or maybe for your jurisdiction. Or it can be a strategic plan that you work on with stakeholders within your library around the goals and strategies that you have for volunteer engagement, especially if you're starting to see some challenges or some threats to the way that things have been working in the past. Again, aging volunteers or shifting demographics. We need to make sure that, that we're responding to that. Um, one of those things, as I talked about, is um, starting with some of those things that feel easier or feel like some of those pieces that um, we can start to, to document what's being done now. So if we have volunteers working in three or four different areas in, in a variety of roles, what does that look like? How do you get there? What does entry level look like? What does week one look like? What does six months look like? What does one year look like? And what does five years look like for that volunteer role? And where are their shifting responsibilities? What kind of training or support or experience do volunteers need to move along that pathway? If you have positions that are harder to fill, if you have those positions that are sort of definitely seem like they have an expiration date, that can be a good place to start with. Um, you may also have critical positions in your library. Again, if, if this is sort of a, a new thought process, you, there may have been um, some some years or some time in which we weren't necessarily thinking strategically about volunteer engagement, you might need to do a little bit of cleanup. And there may be some positions that are um, more important to being able to complete the day-to-day -day operations of the library or maybe uh, identified as critical or strategic because of the goals for your library. So that can be a good place to start as well. Um, alternatively, if you feel like you've got a department that's just knocking it out of the park, you know, things are working really well, 
and especially if you're concerned about pushback or buy-in from others in your library, creating that sort of picture of a well-run um, position or department with volunteer engagement can be a good way to start to share some of those best practices. As I said, we want to make sure that we're inviting volunteers to be part of this. First of all, our volunteers are the people who are most invested in our volunteer engagement program, as is, as it is now. We don't want to change things without involving them. Um, but also volunteers know the work that volunteers do. They know what they do. Um, they want to tell you what they like, and they definitely want to tell you what they don't like about the work that they do, about the way your volunteer engagement program is run. Um, I'm not suggesting that you just open it up to a free-for-all and sort of let them just sort of dump everything on you at once, but I do think that it's important that we get feedback, whether that's a survey, whether that's a focus group, whether that's stakeholder conversations, or all of those. We need to make sure that we're inviting volunteers in to participate in not just saying what they like and don't like, but being part of that next uh, solution or, or um, being part of solving those challenges that they see in the organization. Um, again, we don't just want them to dump on us and be able to sort of run away. Uh, we want to invite them in to identify the challenges that they see and help in us work on solving those challenges. So again, delegating to those volunteers. Sometimes we do have volunteers who are natural leaders or have an affinity to the work. Um, we want to invite those volunteers to lead, to step into leadership roles. It is okay to say that you need to be with the library for a certain amount of time to take on a leadership role to get that experience. But please don't let longevity be the only qualification for leadership. So sometimes, again, uh, in those country road models, we see shift leaders or team leaders or committee chairs um, get those roles or have the opportunity to take on those roles because they've simply been there the longest, right? They've waited everybody else out. Um, that's not a good qualification for leadership. Uh, we want some experience, but we also want to make sure that those volunteers that are leading are good communicators or good team builders or all of those other things. So really when we're thinking about those leadership positions, we want to make sure just like we do for our other positions that we have those um, expectations, those characteristics, that training, and that support. Think about where you can start to incorporate some of the things that you maybe haven't shared with volunteers in the past into your communications channel. Again, we really want to think about how we can turn our vol volunteers into advocates for the work that the library does, the role that the library plays in the community, and think about how we might be able to either bring in other volunteers or help our volunteers tell the story of the work that they're doing. Um, again, yes, would it be much easier if volunteers just stayed in their silo, stayed in their cul-de-sac, and showed up exactly on time and never asked any questions and just did what they were told, yes, but then we would be working with robots and not people. And last time I checked, volunteers are people, so we need to make sure that we are inspiring them. So think about what you can share or what you want to share. And if you are starting to get some pushback and people say, well, why do we need to share that with volunteers? Or what do volunteers need with that information? Or, you know, why should we share that with them? Maybe turn that question around and, and ask, why wouldn't we share that with them? What's the harm in sharing that with them? Is every volunteer going to read everything and memorize it? No. But the goal here is that we create more open, honest, and transparent communication between our volunteers and our libraries. And by doing so, we create much more authentic relationships with our volunteers. If we try to hide something, if we try to sort of filter out what they, what they get or what they should know or need to know, uh, I guarantee they're going to find it out anyway. So the more we can be, as I said, open, honest, and transparent, the more we create that stronger, authentic relationship with our volunteers, which is really what we want. That's where we build retention, right? Retention isn't something we do to volunteers. Retention is an outcome of good recruitment, screening, training, and relationship building practices. All right, next slide, please. Oh, look at me. Oh, my goodness. Sorry, I thought there was one more. Um, anyway, gosh, um, I must have been on overdrive, so I apologize for talking so fast today. Um, 
Donna, do we have questions from the group? I haven't seen any questions in the chat box except a request for um, sample applications that other libraries might be using. Um, and of course, we love for you to share your applications with your colleagues, but also you can submit it on the uh, Get Involved Clearinghouse to be included in the resources there. Yes, and I know um, I know Carla's on the call today too. Um, but yeah, last she time gave I was a great on there, there were some mm -hmm. good applications. Um, I always feel like applications are, are kind of, there's a middle ground, right? We, of course, need some contact information, um, but we don't want to get too far into a million different checkboxes and every possible scenario. I like a good combination of some getting to know you questions, what your motivation is, what other volunteer experiences you've had, so that I can use that to build into an a good interview um, screen, um, but uh, you know, uh, do you speak one of these seven languages? What days and hours are you available? Those are the kinds of things that a uh, volunteer may not know. Like for, if you were to ask me what days I'm available between now and the end of the year, I, I'm not sure I could tell you that, you know, and that would shift tomorrow. So we want to make sure that our applications are responsive to what volunteers need, um, but also help us get to know them and start to build that relationship. Oh, and someone else says they would love a copy of the slides, and we'd be happy to share those with you because it has all of these great resources that Jennifer provided. The Volunteer Match website is amazing. But, um, and she has a lot of ways you can connect with her. Absolutely. But I Please have a feel question. Free to reach out. Yeah. You bet. I have a question for all the attendees. So after listening to today's webinar, what um, will what you learned today help improve, improve services in your library? So I would love for you to share that in the chat box. Go ahead and take a few moments to enter how uh, what you learned today will improve your services, um, what exactly it is. I love the, what you brought up um, about building those relationships. I think that's so important with volunteers. It is, and I think it's one of those things that um, if when you do it well, and I think I was just talking to someone about this, that um, we make volunteer engagement seem deceptively easy, right? And people will think it just magically happens, but there's a lot of work that goes on, and when you do it well, it does appear almost effortless. Um, and we want to make sure that we are not just assuming because it looks effortless, but it is effortless. And building relationships is one of those things that it pays off to invest in relationship building with your volunteers. And if you do have a large volunteer core, if you're engaging, I mean, I would say even dozens or hundreds of volunteers, um, making sure you're thinking about how you are delegating that relationship building, whether that's team leaders or, or shift leaders, committee chairs, um, you as the leader of volunteer engagement cannot also be the person who's building relationships with every one of your volunteers. So we need to think about that as well as we think about that um, delegation of, of work and that, that relationship, um, delegation of that relationship responsibility. Because we do want a volunteer to come in and have a connection with someone who's a mentor or, um, you know, a, a, a shift leader, we don't want them to show up and, and not have anyone talk to them and not feel like they're an important part of the library and not get that connection. So we need to make sure we're thinking about those pieces as well. It doesn't happen automatically. And as we discussed at the beginning, there are some great resources for you. Um, this is focused mostly on library um, topics and that's what our focus is, is, you know, using libraries as a great place where volunteers can really make an impact in their library. I did have a question from one of the attendees about fire um, fighting, if there was any volunteer applications for a fire department. And I'm sure some of this stuff, if you are from another organization that is not a library, I'm sure some of the things on the Get Involved Clearinghouse would be really easily adaptable, but also the Volunteer Match website might have some great uh, resources for you. 
And then the final um, resource is uh, each state has a Get Involved contact. So make sure you reach out to <clears throat> your state contact. And if you're from another state, you can reach out to any of us. We'd be happy to share some of these resources. And that's the great thing about this project is that Get Involved Clearinghouse is open to anybody. And um, thank you, Jennifer, for helping us with this webinar today. We sure appreciate it. And yeah, we appreciate and your time. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. I was just going to say my contact information is up there. So if you are outside of a library system, um, please do feel, to, feel free to reach out. Um, I know we sort of went past that slide quickly, but the Learning Center at Volunteer Match also has um, a bunch of webinars like this same format, all available for free, and the libraries are welcome to join those as well. So if you are looking for some of those basic resources, that's always a good place to start. Definitely. Yeah, we've really enjoyed working with Volunteer Match through this project. And if any of you have any other questions, I'm going to stay on a few more minutes, and you can type them in the chat box. And I'm going to stop, stop the recording now, and I hope you guys have a great day.